Hello and welcome to Eastern Roman History. Today I am joined by Erland Hedegaard, who hosts the podcast Well That Aged Well. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you on. So would you mind telling us a little bit about Well That Aged Well? Yeah, so uh, it started with last year. So for me personally, I've, I was actually playing quite a lot of video games. But uh, the thing is, I figured out, you know, I'm mu- actually new to the TV and I put on quite a lot of YouTube videos and consumed quite a lot of history. But I, and this is actually a quote from, from Hikma History as well. Shout out to him because he's an amazing channel. But I, yeah, like he said, you, you know, in the end, you started to consume too much too much of knowledge you know and you don't know what to do with it so you you know what what do you want to do so i decided i wanted to start i wanted to start a podcast anyway but not sure quite about what so and i with my love for history and you know i wanted to but i don't know enough myself per se so i would so i figured so i figure if i get guests on real professional historians that yeah. can actually tell me about things that I want to know about in history, like Roman history. I do any sort of history, not just Roman, like you do, but, you know, I'm, Christ, I've am done a lot of American history. I've done a lot of Roman history, mainly. I saw you had but, a Egyptologist on as well. Yeah. Yeah, Adrian, uh, uh, I Dod- think it was, Dod- 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 yeah, the, that's something like that. Yeah, he's been to Egypt 96 times. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's really great to be able to talk to these historians and to know, to finally, to not get more knowledge and to share this knowledge, you know. So mm. that's one of the reasons I started Well That Age 12. The name actually was from a friend of mine because you know how poor historians are to name, to name things. Oh, yes. I'm not, uh, a, not that I'm a historian, but, you know. Yes, yeah, so, sometimes... Uh things don't age well and uh yeah. well, especially with history new material always digs up new mm. uh knowledge about something or maybe someone reads the sources and interprets them in a different way and actually that could be much further to the truth than an established uh norm so like uh i think a good example for byzantine history is the whole beginning of the theme system traditionally it was seen to have begun in the middle of the seventh century but actually the actual word theme only appears in the ninth century and Mm. that period between seventh and eighth is the the word strategis is used quite a lot and it also appears on seals and stuff like that and so you have uh a historian called Constantine Zuckerman came along and went, actually, the theme system belongs in the ninth century. This is a, mm. this is almost like a proto theme system. Yeah. Uh, called the so, you know, Strategist system. Yeah. And, you know, I started, I actually posted on my, on my Facebook, what should I call my podcast? And a friend suggest, suggested, well, that aged well. Mm. And I thought it was quite a clever name because originally I was going to call it World History Podcast, which isn't as exciting. But and the name was already taken as well. So uh, mm. yeah, I started recording late October, and here we are. This is the first collaboration I do with Eastern Roman History, which is, like I said in my in my episode, it's one of my favorite channels at the moment. Thank you very much. And if you want to hear. Uh, my appearance on Erlen's podcast. We talk, uh, I talked about the Varangian Guard. And if you would like to have a look, there will be a link to that in the description below. So today, I will be taking on the uh, role of interviewee. And Erlen will be interviewer. And I'll be talking about the Viking attacks on the Eastern Roman Empire. So I want to begin with how, with asking you how how did the Vikings end up in coming to Byzantine Empire? Did you just say through the Mediterranean? Did they hear about it first, or well, how did that happen? So the Viking, so the Viking Age begins in the kind of right at the end of the eighth century AD, hmm. early ninth, and they start going around and. Uh, 
establishing trade routes, exploring, and also plundering. Uh, and one of the routes they managed to take to get to the Eastern Roman Empire, which they have heard about, they call Constantinople Miklagard, which in Old Norse means great city. So they, they've heard of it. And they reach the uh, they reach Constantinople through a route which is actually described by a chap, the Emperor Constantine the Seventh. He described how uh, the Rus, uh, which I will go into more detail about, reached uh, Constantinople. So, if you don't mind, I will read uh, Constantine the yeah, Seventh's uh, passage about how. They got to Constantinople. Uh, it is... Here we go. So, of the coming of the Russians in Monozyla, which are sh uh, refers to a small ship, or like a big, large boat. It's uh, like a one log uh, boat. So it's quite, quite small. Uh, from Russia to Constantinople. So the Monozyla which came down from outer Russia to Constantinople, are from Novgorod, which is a city in the north of Russia. It's, it's relatively close to modern-day St. Petersburg, uh, from Sviatoslav. Uh, so, son of Igor, prince of Russia, had his seat, and others from the city of Smolensk, and from Telutsia, and Chernigov, and from Vyshegrad. All these ke all these come down the river uh, Dnieper and are collected together at the city of Kiev, also called Sembatas. Their Slav tributaries, the so-called Krivichians, and the Lenzanines, Zen Zen and the rest of the Slavonic regions, cut the Monozyla on their mountains in time of winter, and when they have prepared them, as spring approaches, and the ice melts, they bring them on to the neighbouring lakes. And since these lakes debouche into the river Dniep, uh, Dniepia, they enter thence onto the same river and come down to Kiev. So in the winter, they make their ships and then they come down to Kiev and draw the ships along to be finished and sell them to the Russians. The Russians buy these bottoms, only furnishing them with oars and rowlocks and other tackle from their old monozyla, which they dismantle, and so they fit them out. And in the month of June they move off down the river Dnieper and come to Vitichev, which is a tributary city of the Russians. And there they gather during two or three days, and when all of the monozyla are collected together, then they set out and come down the said Dnieper River. And first they come to the first barrage, called Esupi, which means in Russian and Slavonic, do not sleep. The barrage itself is as narrow as wide, is as narrow as the width of the polo ground. So that refers to the polo ground in Constantinople, where uh, they pay, played a form of polo. Uh, in the middle of it are rooted high rocks, which stand out like islands. Against these then comes the water, and wells up and dashes down over the other side, with a mighty and terrific din. Therefore the Russians do not venture to pass between them, but put into the bank hard by, disembarking the men onto dry land, leaving the rest of the goods on board the monozyla. They then strip and feeling with their feet to avoid striking on a rock. This they do, some at the prow, some amidships, while others again in the stern punt with poles, and with all this careful procedure they pass this first barrage, edging, edging, a, edging round under the riverbank. When they have passed this barrage, they re-embark the others from the dry land and sail away, and come down to the second barrage, caution called in Russian Ulvorsi, and in Slavonic Ostrovunprak, which means the island of the barrage. This one is like the first, awkward and not to be passed through, 
Once again they disembark the men and convey the Monozyla past on the first occasion. Similarly, they pass the third barrage, also called Gelandry, which means in Slavonic, noise of the barrage. And then the fourth barrage, the one big, uh, the big one, called in Russian A4, and in Slavonic, Nasit, because the pelicans nest in the stones of the barrage. At this barrage, all put into land, prowl foremost, and those who are depute to keep the watch with them, get out. And off they go. These men and keep vigilant, and keep vigilant watch for the Pechenegs. The remainder, taking up the goods which they have on board the Monozyla, conduct the slaves in their chains, pass by land six miles until they are through the barrage. Then, partly dragging their Monozyla, partly uh, porting, portaging them on their shoulders, they convey them to the far side of the barrage, and then putting them on the river, and loading up their baggage, they embark themselves, and again sail off in them. When they come to the fifth barrage, called, called in Russian Varuforos, and in Slavonic Volniprak, because it forms a large lake, they again convey their monozyla through at the edges of the river, as at the first and second barrages, and arrive at the sixth barrage, called in Russian Lienti, and in Slavonic, Varutsi, that, in, that is the boiling of the water. And this too they pass similarly. And thence they sail away to the seventh farage, called in Russian Strukun, and in Slavonic Naprezi, which means little barrage. This they pass at the so-called Ford of Vra, where the Chersonites cross over from Russia and the Pechenegs to Cherson which ford is as wide as the Hippodrome, and measured upstream from the bottom as far as the rocks break surface, a bow shot in length. It is at this point, therefore, that the Pechenegs come down and attack the Russians. After traversing this place, they reach the island called St. Gregory, on which island they perform their sacrifices because a gigantic oak tree stands there, and they sacrifice live cocks. Arrows, too, they peg in around them, and others bread and meat, and something of whatever each may have, as is their custom. They also throw lots regarding the cocks, whether to slaughter them, or to eat them as well, or to leave them alive. From this island onwards, the Russians do not fear the Pechenegs until they reach the river Selinas. So then they start off thence and sail for four days until they reach the lake, which forms the mouth of the river on which is the island of St. Etherios. Arrived at this island, they rest themselves there for two or three days, and they re-equip their monozyla, which such tackle as is needed, sails and masts and rudders, which they bring with them. Since this lake is the mouth of the river, as has been said, and carries on down to the sea, and the island of St. Etherios lies on the sea, they come thence to the Dniesta River, and having got safely there, they rest again. But when the weather is propitious, they put to sea and come to the river called Aspros. And after resting there too, in like manner, they again set out and come to the Selinas, to the so-called branch of the Danube River. And until they are past the river Selinas, the Pechenegs keep pace with them. And if it happens that the sea casts a monozylon on shore, they all put on to land in order to present a united opposition to the Pechenegs. But after the Selinas, they fear nobody, but entering the territory of Bulgaria, they come to the mouth of the Danube. From the Danube, they proceed to the Konopas, and from the Konopas to Constantia, and from Constantia to the river Varna, and from Varna they come to the river Ditzina, all of which are Bulgarian territory. From the Ditzina they reach the district of Mesembria, and there at last their voyage, fraught with such travail and terror, such difficulty, such difficulty and danger, is at an end. The severe manner of life of these same Russians in winter time is as follows. When the month of November begins, their chiefs together with all the Russians at once leave Kiev and go off to Pulidia, 
which means rounds, that is, to the Slavonic regions of the Varerians and Drugovicians and Krovicians and Severians, and the rest of the Slavs who are tributaries of the Russians. There they are maintained through the winter, but then once more starting from the month of April, when the, I when the ice of the Dnieper River melts, they come down to Kiev. They then pick up their monozyla, as has been said above, and fit them out, and come down to Romania. And there we go, that is how Constantine the Seventh describes how the Rus got to Constantinople. A very long, a very treacherous, and dangerous journey. But as I'm sure you're about to ask, who are the Rus? Uh, yeah. And why why is Constantine talking about Russians in this talk about the Vikings? So uh the Russians were Vikings the first too, weren't they? Yes, so uh with the the Viking Age you have Norway, Denmark and Sweden. And so hmm. as they go out you have uh, Norwegians and Danes, they conquer places like Normandy and parts of England. Uh, but also, the Swedish Vikings, they travel eastward and use all of the large river arteries that are in uh, European Russia to conquer uh, lands for themselves. And in much the same way as you had, say, in Normandy, with a, a Norman duke over uh, Norman and Frankish subjects, or in England as well, uh, you have the the Swedish Vikings ruling over Slavic tribes, which had lived there for many years. Um, and so the Rus and the uh, Varangians, as, the, as they're called uh, as well, they eventually, over a process of a couple of centuries, uh, they Russify. And so the, the ruling Rus become uh, Christian and Slavic and so on, just like the subjects they rule over. Uh, but that is a process that happens over a couple of hundred years. And so yeah. during that process, uh, you could quite uh, easily and do talk about a Viking uh, kingdom in Russia, which on many occasions thought it was a good idea to attack the Eastern Roman Empire. Oh. And so uh, the question is, when did they start uh, their first raid on Byzantine territory? And Warren Treadgold, ha he is a uh, Byzantine historian. He, believed, he believes that 818 or 819 AD is the date when the Rus first attacked the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, this is for a couple of reasons, which I will go into uh, after I talk about the raid itself. So uh, what happened? So uh, the Vikings attack the coastline of the Crimea. So the Romans have a small outpost in the Crimea centered on Cherson, and the Vikings attack it. And then they start attacking the coastline right away the around right uh, right away around the Eastern Black Sea, uh, right up to a city called Amastris on the uh, Black Sea coast of Anatolia, which is uh, the northern section. So, uh, and the raid is very violent. It's very successful in that they take lots of loot and plunder and slaves and so on and it is completely uncontested as well uh, there is a source a a saint life for a man called saint george of amastris who uh, says that uh, there wasn't there wasn't any resistance to it um Actually, so I still think I want to ask about the because you know, you know, the Romans, ancient Rome, they protected yeah. the borders quite well. 
But how did the Byzantines protect the border when the Vikings first entered Byzantine territory? How easy was it for them to just cross, come across, start trading? So the Vikings of Rus, uh, I mean, it was difficult to actually get to the Eastern Roman Empire from the north uh, because so the Rus were in the more northern part of Russia. So like uh, from Kiev uh, mm. in modern day Ukraine to right up to Novgorod. So uh, big expanse of land. But in between Kiev and the Black Sea, you had the steppe nomads. So the Pechenegs, the uh, Magyars, the Khazars, which could prevent the Rus from entering the Black Sea. And it was vital for the Byzantines to maintain good relations with first the Khazars and then the Pechenegs because they could block access or open access to the Rus. So if, if you had good relations with them, then uh, the Pechenegs will largely keep off the Russians and they would be able to trade. And if the Pechenegs block access through the Dnieper and Dniester rivers, then the Rus uh, can't get anywhere because uh, the Pechenegs are too strong to let them through. And actually, this comes back to the first, the uh, second appearance of the Rus in 839, so uh, a few years, about 15 years later, where the a Russian embassy has been sent to Constantinople to foster some good relations uh, and, and make contact. And the Emperor Theophilus sends them to the court of the Emperor of the Franks, uh, Louis the Pious, because they can't actually come back the way they had come because it was too dangerous. It had been, uh, the way had been closed by the uh, Magyars and Khazars. So there is the element of the Byzantines could rely on other people to keep out a lot of danger. Um, so they were they were loyal to the empire. I wouldn't say loyal, but uh, in in the more diplomatic sense of they had good relations with the empire. Uh, uh, the emperors. Uh, could send a tributary uh, sum of money to the Pechenegs just as a kind of uh, we're friends. Also, here's some money to uh, uh, emphasize the fact. Um, so, yeah, so um, this raid in 818 catches the Eastern Roman Empire completely by surprise because the Armeniacon theme doesn't have the sailors or equipment necessary to actually deal with the Viking attack. So um, uh, the primary source mentions that no one was lending aid, no one resisting, uh, and there, there wasn't any soldiers nearby to actually deal with the Vikings. So they could come along, raid anything they want, slaughter, uh, the inhabitants and then leave and the Armenia con theme still hadn't managed to organize itself to defend the coast by the time they had left uh, and this leads the Emperor Leo V uh, who was the Emperor at the time to reorganize the Armenia con theme to accommodate this danger the theme of Paphlagonia is established so uh, some of the troops which were formerly part of the Armenia con theme are are detached and made into a new theme. And this theme is also given a a naval uh, captain and a few ships, and also a, a province in Chaldea is created with a naval defense in mind. And this means that from now on, the Northern Black Sea coast is uh, more well defended is better defended against Rus raids. Uh, so what kind of places do they raid? Do they raid like monasteries, castles, or 
just the, the villagers? Um, so at this period, the, the Eastern Roman Empire don't really have castles, but they do have fortified towns and monasteries and churches and villages, and all of these uh, get raided. Uh, the the account itself talks more about the uh, slaughter. So it um, he says that there were ruined churches, defiled sanctuaries, overthrown altars, violent libations and sacrifices, the ancient Tauric people's practice of killing strangers, uh, now renewed by these, and the slaughter of male and female virgins. So uh, we get so nuns, monks, uh, churchmen, and also the communities around them. So it was quite shocking. Um, so this is this is before the Eastern Roman Empire. They they get kind of down down hill, right? So they're kind of quite rich at this point, right? So the empire in the ninth century is in the process of a revival. So in the seventh century, we have the calamitous invasions of the Persians and Muslims, which result in. I think it's roughly two thirds of the empire being lost. So Egypt, the Levant, uh, so that's like Syria, Jerusalem, uh, Israel, uh, being lost, as well as North Africa, uh, and also most of Italy and the Balkans is lost. Uh, so the empire at this point has managed to regain Greece and regain a foothold on Italy, and also it controls Anatolia. But throughout the 8th century, which is kind of a, a time of consolidation. So they're retrenching the resources they actually have and are able to start taking the offensive against the Bulgars and Arabs. Yeah. Territory isn't being... These expeditions aren't for territory, but more the denial of territory, taking loot, plunder, uh, Slaves, uh, or, and also you're talking, you're talking about the Vikings in the empire. Sorry, you're talking about the Vikings now, not the Eastern Romans. Oh, well, these are the Eastern yeah. Romans. I'm just talking okay. about uh, their mode of warfare oh, okay, in okay. the eighth century. And so, by the ninth century, they are economically, culturally, and starting to be militarily strong enough to actually take and hold territory. It's in this period mm. that the Byzantines start to push into uh, eastern Anatolia, uh, western Armenia, and start retaking places there. They're also pushing into the Balkans, uh, so like uh, northern Greece, Bulgaria, places like that, and also increasing their presence in southern Italy. So Byzantium is on the resurgence in the 9th century, but they're not quite there yet. It's really in the 10th century that you see the major conquests of Syria, uh, the Balkans, Italy, and so on. So, Lind so Lindisfarne already happened quite a, a century earlier, right? So Lindis are, are, they, are they aware of the Vikings? Or well, actually, the Lindisfarne happens in... 7, I think, year 7, 700, if I'm... Late seven mid seven hundred, I, I believe. I may be wrong. I thought it was eight forty. Yeah, something. that might be right. This is you might you might be right. This is right when the Viking, the Viking Age starts to really get going, where you've got Viking attacks all over Europe and the Mediterranean, mm. and also uh, a couple of adventurous people going into places like North Africa and mm. uh, the Middle East as well. But uh, but where but where did, were they aware aware of the Vikings already? Or what did they come as a shock factor for the for the? Oh, it was definitely a shock. Um, it was, it was more. They knew of them, but they didn't really. The Byzantines didn't really think much of them, but because they have a, yeah. uh, admittedly somewhat arrogant worldview, but it's they were how here, they can, right? They won't how come they to the, the empire. World. Uh, yeah, so they had, they were the, I, I think as I said last time, the, the pinnacle of civilization, and then everyone else is kind of degrees of mm. uh, 
barbarians. barbarians. So the the Persians and the Caliphate were the the second only to the Empire themselves. Mm. And then you go down the list. So you've got like the Frankish Emperor, the Khazar Khagan, and then you've got like the Duke of Naples at the bottom and stuff like that. So, and the Russians are down there as well. So, um, but they didn't see it as a threat that they were at this moment in time. I think it happened. The Viking attacks were infrequent enough for them not to have to think about them mm. all that much. So when they did happen, like in the major Russian attack of 860 on Constantinople itself, it was a huge shock to the Byzantines. And it, this was a... Uh, the attack of 860 was a major Rus expedition against Constantinople. It had 200 ships involved and if we have roughly about a hundred men per long ship that's about twenty thousand uh vikings so 200 times 100 uh attacking uh the city of constantinople and so and this is very much in the style of a rust raid they were they were wanted to try that hand at taking Constantinople, but it's too strong there. The city did have a garrison of about 4,000 men permanently, and uh, when it wasn't, well, there wasn't a campaign going on, it also had the Imperial Navy and also the Tagmata nearby. But this is what made the 860 attack so alarming, was that the Emperor at the time, Michael III, had led the army east to fight the Saracens, uh, so the Abbasid Caliphate, and also the navy was being deployed as well to uh, take on the Moorish pirates of Crete and also uh, uh, Arab raids against the coastline. So there's no navy and there's also no army near Constantinople. And uh, so the it's up to the eparch of Constantinople, a guy called Nicola, Nicholas Urufas, to organize the defenses. And he tells Michael III what's going on. And so Michael III turns his army around and goes at full speed back to Constantinople because this is a serious threat. And um, actually, the patriarch of the time, a chap called Photius, described uh, the attack in a homily, which is like a uh, speech, a church speech. Uh, and he said, a nation dwelling somewhere from uh, far from our country, barbarous, nomadic, armed with arrogance, unwatched, unchallenged, leaderless, has so suddenly in the twinkling of an eye, like a wave of the sea poured over our frontiers, and as a wild boar has devoured the inhabitants of the land, like grass or straw or a crop, sparing nothing from man to beast, nor respecting female weakness, not pitying tender infants, not reverencing the hoary hairs of old men, softened, softened by nothing that is wont to move human nature to pity, even when it has sunk to that of wild beasts but boldly thrusting their swords through persons of every age and sex. Do you not recollect that unbearable and bitter hour when the barbarians' boats came sailing down at you, wafting a breath of cruelty, savagery, and murder? So I think we get a, the emotional feeling of the effect of this attack. And it was pretty serious the the attack lasted for several months they were there for a long time they overran the prince's island so there's a small collection of islands in the sea of marmara so that's the small sea in between uh, the hellespont to the south which is the uh, straits and then you've got the bosphorus and constantinople in the north 
and that's the Bosphorus Strait, and the Sea of Marmara is in between. Uh, so they overrun the Prince's Islands, they attacked the, um, burned and looted the hinterlands around Constantinople, and also started raiding the coastline of uh, Asia Minor in the Sea of Marmara, a place called Bithynia. Uh, and eventually, uh, in June, uh, Michael III led his troops back and uh, they jointly drove the Vikings out. Um, when they came up against the actual Byzantine army, they were defeated and driven out. Uh, but while they were there, it was a scene of chaos and destruction. And then in the following year, um, there was another Viking attack in roughly this area. Uh, but that wasn't by the Rus, that was actually a uh, Danish-Norwegian excursion which had come round the Mediterranean and up into the uh, Eastern Roman Empire. So they had had quite a voyage to get there, and that consisted of about 360 ships. Uh, but compared to other Viking attacks. This is quite a medium-sized one, the 861, with 200 ships. Uh, some of them could be as small as 54 ships. So there was an attack in 844 against the Iberian Peninsula, which had 84 ships, uh, 54 ships involved, sorry. But you could also have very large ones, like the attack on Paris in 885, which had uh, 700 ships and boats involved with about 30 to 40,000 mm. men. Um, so yeah, it's uh, quite shocking. It's probably the best way to describe it, and also very uh, destructive. And also very violent. So in this attack, uh, 22 clergymen were tied to the sterns of Ooh. a longboat, and the Vikings... Uh, practice hacking at them with their axes. Hmm. Sounds nice. Sounds lovely. Lovely. But after 860, there isn't another major attack. Um, I mean, there is also the case of... Uh, there's also the possibility that some attacks happened, but we don't know about them because the sources don't mention them. But it could also be the case that because they don't mention them, they didn't happen as well. So, um, But the next attack that actually happens is in 907, where a Rus raid comes down. So this is nearly 50 years later, and the Rus come down. Uh, the empire is in the middle of a war with the Arabs, which are raiding the Aegean, and so the fleet isn't there again, and the army has been... Uh, it's mainly the fleet which is the, the big uh, problem here, in that the fleet has just been busy fighting Arab pirates and Moorish ones, which yeah. have been raiding the Aegean. There had been the sack of Thessalonica, which was the second largest city in the empire only a few years before. Um, and so the the Empire is in a bit of a naval uh, engagement at the moment. So this is a perfect opportunity for the Vikings to attack again. And they mm. do. And they... But the, the attack was, during the war, this attack must be good news for the Arabs, right? It, it distracts the Byzantines and they got now two sides to focus on. So this must be good news for the Arabs, right? Mm. Well, that's if the Arabs knew about it, though. Because it was, it was. I think it's less to see this as a coordinated attack and more uh, opportunism on the side of the yeah. Russ, who who would have known uh, that known about what's going on in the Aegean through just as I was saying before with Constantine the Seventh, the trade between Constantinople and the Russ. You would have had news coming back that oh, the uh, Byzantines are fighting. Uh, the the Saracens and uh, maybe it's a good time to 
go and loot and plunder for some of them. So a few ships arrive and they attack Mesembria and they disembark and then they go, they march south through Frace and loot and pillage as they go. And their ships sail around and they start attacking the coastline of around Constantinople. So there isn't mm. any attempts on the actual city itself, which is too well defended to attack, but the hinterlands suffer. And these would be quite rich because they'd be one of the few areas where you had very high numbers of troops concentrated. So all of the Tagmata, which were the elite field troops of the empire, were settled in, uh, came from Thrace and uh, Bithynia. So they're all very close yeah. to Constantinople. Um, but you mentioned the Norwegian Danish attack the second time. Were, were they more prepared? Or did they have the lightning, lightning one strike twice attitude? It's. I think they are more prepared. It's less talked about. I think it's the the 860 attack just caught the empire completely off guard. And also, yeah. it wasn't like the previous attack. It wasn't just some province which, uh, which happened a lot more regularly with the Arabs and the Bo and the Bulgars attacking. But uh, this was a strike on near and around Constantinople itself, which I'm sure would have brought back uh, some unpleasant memories of when the Arabs tried to attack Constantinople in. 717 uh but uh yeah this this is more of a almost a a typical viking excursion to loot plunder and uh sail away in 907 and then the russians so... the rus vikings don't return until 941 uh when the uh, the Prince of Rus actually gets involved with this one. The Prince of Rus, Igor, in 941, he, he collects together um, he, for a major expedition against Constantinople to, uh, in a typical Rus raider, loot, burn, and so on. But they... Uh, they arrive, and this is pretty serious. So the Rus attack has lots of ships. Uh, I believe there's something like, they say something like a thousand vessels. Wow. So this is a, this is um, a royal Viking raid. And so what were what were the targets this time? Was it Constantinople itself, or was attack, it just the same as the last time? Um, well, I say attack. They attack the region of Constantinople. Mm. I don't think they actually go. They don't ever go for the city itself. But in this occasion, so they arrive in June 941, and their armada reaches Constantinople. But you have the same crisis as nearly a hundred years earlier, with the navy is out to sea, and also the army is busy as well. So it, this is in the middle of the tenth century. So this is uh, the time where Byzantium is starting to kick out the Arabs from Armenia and places like that. Mm. Uh, and so there's no army. There's no navy. All they have is. 15 uh, old warships which are in the warehouses of the harbour and they refit them and they kit them out with fire rowers so they convert them into fire ships and then the uh, proto vestarios Theophanes he is a, a government official he leads the defense of Constantinople and he uses his fire ships to attack the Rus fleet. And are you using were you using Greek fire or just yes, normal? This is Greek fire. fire. So Greek fire is we don't know the formula exactly, but it is a kind of uh, 
a little bit like napalm, but it it can be ignited and shot at from a mm. siphon, and it cannot be put out by water. So actually, and one this of the is things that happens in the attack is that Theophanes' fire ships, um, not only do they sink several of the rough ships, but lots of Russ burn to death in the water as mm. well. Um, Sounds like a lesson death. Yes. With a touch of irony as well. But, uh, mm. yeah, so he's able to drive off the uh, the attack which is heading to Constantinople and instead they decide to raid and pillage the coast of Bithynia instead which uh, they do. They're able to land right. and they're able to attack the coastline but the uh, local forces are so local thematic forces are able to keep the Rus in check so there is some destruction but they're able to stop them getting any further and when the main army arrives uh they they've high tailed it back from uh western armenia they're able to f uh meet the vikings in battle and defeat them and drive them back into the sea and the vikings try to escape by crossing overnight to thrace and escape over land, but Theophanes' fire ships are able to stop them and burn them. And uh, that's the end of Igor's expedition. And of course, most people probably know that Dragon Fire was in, in Game of Thrones was inspired by Greek fire. Just a little fun fact. Yes, yes. Uh, I think this, uh, it, it, com it perhaps it conjures up the right image, if not exactly the the, the true one, it's like uh, mm. Mm, you didn't really have ships exploding with uh, green fire, no. but you did have. It was, uh, I think, the kind of terrifying spectacle of it that is does they do get across in that particular episode of Game of Thrones. But yes, um, and then after that, so this they drive them out in September, so they've been there for three months. And then the Vikings manage to slip away and return to Russia. But so something I asked kind of similar question on, on our episode in, in my podcast. What was the population's reaction when it came? Uh, we don't know. I think the closest thing, because we don't have sources from the population. Uh, this is for. Well, most people can't are illiterate, uh, but mm. we do we do get uh, sources from people who would be closer to uh, everyday people. So, like in eight sixty, you have Photius, the patriarch, who although he's not he is the top of the church hierarchy, he is also minister to lots of ordinary people, and I think gives you a good idea of what ordinary people thought about all of these raids uh, um, and also saint life so uh, which would usually be written by uh, clergymen in the provinces and l lower down the church hierarchy which would also be closer to ordinary people rather than government officials or uh, emperors and I think that's where you get the more I wouldn't say working man, but the more, the more everyday sort of person's mm. view of things. Um, so, like with the with the uh, life of Saint George of Amastris is uh, is a good example. So it's like the, uh, this tribe, malefic uh, maleficent in both fact and reputation, begging its devastation for uh, bringing its devastation through Pontus and spreading itself over the rest of the coast penetrated even to the homeland of the saints, mercilessly smiting every race and every age, neither pitying the old nor sparing the infants, but arming its murderous hand against all alike. It hastened to compass destruction as much as it could. 
and stuff like that. So you get, um, you do get an idea of how people felt about these things. So what about the monks? Do we have any testaments from them, or did they probably all slaughtered by the by the Rus? I think it would cut. That also falls under the saint lives because lots of monks or clergymen wrote these things. Um, so like the life of most of them are usually anonymous though mm. so like the life of saint george which i just mentioned is an anonymous author uh the uh yeah, they're usually from anonymous authors or if they did have an author maybe you have a manuscript problem where maybe the front page where it says this was written by has been uh lost or something like that mm. which is the case for a couple of uh, histories as well where the, the the bit where they have the name is missing um, but they have the rest of the manuscript so uh, sometimes it's as simple as that for why we don't have a name and sometimes um, mm. for anonymity's sake they just don't yeah and uh, so how do and yeah I don't know I haven't really have anything else to add a thing personally well i think we still you have, feel like we should we have yeah. two more things just to cover so yeah the so vladimir the great who i mentioned about the varangian guard he actually led a what one could call perhaps a, a viking attack on cherson uh for what reason we don't know but it may just have been for loot and plunder and uh when he he captures cherson and he is sent a message by Basil II, who asks him, uh, "Please, I need help. Please send me uh, as many men as you can, as you can, because I need to defeat this rebellion by Bardas Focus." And Vladimir agrees. He gets a an imperial marriage. He converts to Christianity. He sends him six thousand Vrangians. So they would they would be these. Uh, Norse warriors, which have been terrorizing things. That's not to say that Russia and the Byzantines had poor relations all the time. Usually, and especially in the 10th century, as Russia starts to become more of a organized state with like a, a feudal system, and more uh, organized. They are more more interested in treaties and diplomacy than just going down and mm. looting and plundering uh, and he attacks it and so you have the conversion of Russia when Vladimir attacks in 989 and also the beginning of the rank for, of the Varangian Guard so um, I mean you could say that this starts to begin a process where the the Varangians or Norse warriors rather than attacking the empire start to actually serve it so you have people mm. like Harold Hardrada join their ranks, um, and others. And actually, we do know roughly how the Varangian Guard would have been replenished over time. So there is a case in 1011, roughly, during right. Basil's reign, where a man called Chriso Care, with a band of 800 Varangians, comes down and to join the Varangian Guard, and. He is asked to uh, disarm when he meets the emperor, and he refuses. And so he decides to attack the coasts of Bithynia, and the Byzantines eventually catch him, trick him into treating with them, and have them all slaughtered. But and the Varan yeah, and the Varangian Guard is what we talked about in my episode on my podcast with Eastern Roman history. Indeed. But this episode shows how the Varangians would have replenished the Varangian Guard from Sweden mm. and also Rus as well. And also, the actually, the last uh, Viking attack on Constantinople happens in 1043 during the reign of Constantine the Ninth, and it is the very last. Uh, Russ attack. It's, it's so. How old is that girl? The the last attack on um, Constantinople. 
actually, uh, to the Emperor of the Time's credit, Constantine the Ninth, it goes very well for the Byzantines. Um, so unlike two of the previous times, they actually have a navy, they're well prepared for it, uh, the whole thing erupts because there's a dispute in Constantinople with Rus and Roman uh, merchants, and this leads to a conflict where Yaroslav the Wise decides to attack the empire, and he assembles a very large fleet of ships and boats, and he sends them against the uh, Constantinople, but when they arrive, they are met with the Byzantine fleet with fire ships, and also Constantine has positioned soldiers on the coastline as well to uh, kill anyone that lands. And the attack, Constantine offers final terms, uh, the Rus refuse, and so the Byzantines launch the attack by sending three fire ships into the midst of the Rus navy. They cause all manner of devastation and confusion. Again, you have people jumping off their ships and into the sea and lots of people drowning and being burned to death. Uh, Michael Selos, who was present at the time, he was he wrote a very famous chronicle of his era. Uh, he says there were so many corpses that were just blocking the cliffs uh, afterwards. And many people that managed to get onto land uh, or their ships ran aground were then slaughtered by the Romans on the beaches. Uh, so the the Romans send the whole fleet in to engage the Rus fleet. The Rus are routed and they flee. Uh, the, the Romans send 24 ships to pursue them, but the Rus actually uh, surround them and destroy them and then continue back home. Uh, but also the Rus survivors that actually managed to make it off the beach, uh, they are captured and they're all executed. Uh, or, uh, yeah, and all executed. Or used as prisoners in the raid by Constantine the Ninth. Um, so the Rus, it's a colossal disaster for the Rus and a big mm. win for Constantine the Ninth. Who's just come off of a major rebellion by one of his generals, George Maniakes. Um And that's the end. That's the last Russian attack on uh, Constantinople. So, and with with this last attack is uh, twenty years later. You also have the the end of the Viking Age itself. When uh, in 1066, Harold Harada invaded England and was killed by Harold II's army at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. And the death, and this is the traditional death of the last Viking, Harold Hardrada, mm. and with him ends the Viking Age. So, so I, by, the, by the end of the last Viking attack, did Constantinople have its famous three walls by then? Or were it oh been... yes, the, the Theodosian walls had been constructed uh, in the early to mid 5th century. Hmm. So, although if the Rus were to attack it, they would probably go against the sea walls, which only had a single wall to defend it. Yeah. It... What so, do you think? That is the, the Viking attack, the Viking invasions of the Eastern Roman Empire. So thank you for having me on. It was a pleasure to come on your channel. Oh, no problem. It was a pleasure to do our collaboration. I very much enjoyed yes. doing both. And you're welcome back to my podcast anytime you wish to, of course. And uh, Thank you very much. Yeah, I just want to say to, my, to the listeners, if you're interested in checking out my podcast, we are available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you can find podcasts. And uh, we got some exciting episodes coming up because I I don't know when you're going, going to release this episode, but uh, if it, this week, the 20th, I th no, th sorry, I think it was 13th, Thursday, the upcoming Thursday, yeah, 13th, we are going to have Adrian Goldsworthy on to talk about the Roman army. 
which is probably be a fantastic episode. We also do, and we don't to talk about next episode after that. Will be about Hannibal and the Battle of Kanya. And following that again, we're going to have Anthony Barrett to talk about Caligula. So we got quite a few exciting episodes. We also got Operation Valkyrie from World War II, the famous inside plot to kill Adolf Hitler. And Dinosaurs are going to be a future episode. So stay tuned. You definitely want to subscribe to the podcast if you if you want to hear more about Roman history and the world history in general. Excellent. Uh, do you have any last questions? I don't think so. No. Right. I think we covered basic stuff, didn't we? Hmm. So uh, I, I tried to. So I'm not a. I'm not a expert on Vikings. I'm more. I've done this in the 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 Vikings from the Byzantine perspective, and I hope that is mm. what I've managed to yeah. get across. So. I think you definitely did. So if that is all. I'd like to thank everyone very much for listening, and this has been Eastern Roman History.